It appears Starship Serial Number 10 is go to attempt SpaceX's third high-altitude flight. A second crew member is named for Dragon's first completely commercial Inspiration4 mission. Starlink gets its next launch date, and the Mars rover is our honorable mention. Again, I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. So Elon started off his week with some positive Sunday vibes, tweeting that there's a good chance of flying Starship SN10 this week. Most likely feeling this way because the FAA gave the green light for the next launch to 10 clicks and back. To further prepare for this journey into the blue, on Monday the vehicle attempted to perform its first three-engine static fire, but was aborted prior to any fiery farts. However, the following day the rocket successfully gave our eyes a nice whiff of that highly anticipated butt belch. <laughs> But the test was not without its sharks. The next day, Lab Padre captured images of engineers removing one of SN10's Raptor engines. Elon said his team found that one of the engines was suspect, so they swapped it out. And that they did, so Starship was reset to rip a hot one on Thursday. After the conclusion of the test, road closures for today, that would be Friday, were canceled possibly indicating that the test was great success and that SpaceX is now targeting Monday for the 10-click flight. TFRs are in place for that. Meanwhile, there are plenty of other things going on around the company's Boca facilities. It's a big place after all. So many activities! New domes have been spotted being constructed at the site. Not sure what they're for. Obviously, Starship Super Heavy requires giant domes, but these are also suspect. Finger your theory down in the comments. SN15's nose cone was stacked, new flap deliveries keep coming, which is helpful since SpaceX has added to their roster of current starships. SN19 has been conceived and is progressing through the embryonic stage of development. After nine weeks, it will be a fully fledged rocket fetus. And like all the others, once SpaceX delivers it, the new baby starship will shortly after perish, whether from a manual disassembly or an unscheduled one elsewhere. The species does have one of the shortest lifespans. SpaceX is also working behind the scenes on other related projects at other locales. At an undisclosed place, possibly in Hawthorne, California, their headquarters, the company reportedly assembled and demonstrated Starship's elevator concept for NASA, as part of their contract with the agency to build a moon lander prototype for Artemis. This elevator will allow people and cargo to embark and disembark from Starship while on the moon's surface. Or, hear me out, they could just jump and fall in slow motion with style. So long as you don't rip your spacesuit, you should be able to limp away. Elon's excited about it. And in an interesting turn of events, Roberts Road is back on the menu. SpaceX is building some kind of hangar or warehouse there. We haven't spoken about this site at Cape Canaveral, Florida for quite some time. The last we did, the rocket company was going to convert it into the East Coast Starship facility, but pulled the plug on those plans after Mark 1 was force-fed to death. Only speculation exists at the moment as to what is going on here. It's a billion dollar idea. <laughs> and let's not forget about Deimos and Phobos, Starship's new oil rigs turning sea spaceports. Of course, SpaceX is still renovating them, but Elon thinks one may be in limited operation by the end of this year. And although at first rocket fuel will be delivered to those platforms, eventually they will have their own means of producing methane for the beefy vehicle. But as far as delivering starships themselves to the platforms, once completed assembly in Boca, they'll just fly themselves there from the launch site. But like the Starlink constellation, Elon's main goal is to just not go bankrupt building these platforms. Not bankrupt. Right, and not going. But briefly heading back to our discussions surrounding the South Texas site, Space Padre Isle reported that they have a close friend that seems to have landed a gig with SpaceX to move down there and begin working on Starship Super Heavy's orbital launch tower in just a few weeks, saying that he'll be working 12-hour shifts seven days a week for a year. So somebody go tell Mike Rowe that there's still a dirty job out there that he needs to give a go. After many months of going AWOL, the prodigal son, Zeus, a pricey Boston Robotics toy, has returned home, although he may have never left. SpaceX was seen taking him for a walk on the newly renovated landing pad this week. He's used to investigate anomalies when sending a human, even the one least liked in the workplace, is just too risky. Good boy. And lastly, before moving on, if you want to ride on Starship's first trip around the moon, the man behind the mission wrote that there's a big update coming for Dear Moon next week. Perhaps he's going to do something similar to Inspiration4 and raffle off a couple seats for charity, or maybe he's going to go the other way and make us all fight over who gets to go. 
If that's the case, dibs and shotgun. You can't do that. Can't do, cannot, stamp it. Can't do double stamp it, no erases. Moving on to Dragon News Meow. Crew-1 astronauts that launched to the space station back in November have officially been in space more than 100 days and will be returning in a couple months. Out of the three crew capsules, this is the longest one has been in space. Demo-2, with Bob and Doug, orbited for 64 days, and Demo-1's mission lasted just shy of a week. Also, the second passenger for Inspiration4 has been chosen. Haley, a physician's assistant of St. Jude Children's Hospital and former patient, will ride in the Hope seat for the commercial orbital mission. At age 29 or 30, depending on the final launch date, she'll be the youngest person to go to space. Of course, so long as nobody younger gets picked for the additional seats. The previous record holder was Sally Ride, who was 32 when she hitched a ride on the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1983. The winners of the two remaining seats for Inspiration4 will be named by the end of March. Now to Starlink. The next Falcon 9 launches for another flock of Starlink satellites. The booster static fire was completed this week and is now targeting Sunday the 28th at 8.37 p.m. Eastern for liftoff from LC-39A. This comes after recent delays surrounding the previous launch's failed landing attempt. And all we know at the moment concerning that is that Hans said the anomaly was related to heat damage. Thanks, Hans. Hans. But concerning Starlink internet service itself, Elon said those of you who already have the UFO on a stick up and running may start seeing much higher download speeds at times because they're testing system upgrades, ultimately increasing to about 300 megabits per second later this year. Now it's time for today's honorable mention. We're back to discuss more golden nuggets. The Mars 2020 rover, Perseverance, has dropped on the Martian surface after successfully touching down on the red planet. Since last Friday's episode, NASA released footage of the landing sequence using a few of their more than 20 onboard cameras. First, here's the parachute deployment. Check out how rapidly that puppy inflates due to the thin atmosphere and the high speed of the capsule. Designing these chutes in a way so that they won't shred while supporting such a hefty load is a monstrous challenge for the agency. And that pattern of red or orange and white you see there is to aid parachute engineers while analyzing data during its deployment. They had to choose these colors wisely, lest untested dyes damage the canopy. But the team decided to have a little fun with the pattern and implemented a code into it, taking an all of six hours for a few people on the internet, like Abella and his dad, to break it, revealing the hidden message as Percy's JPL team's motto, Dare Mighty Things. You guys know I've always been a fan of the parachutes, but I do get this warm feeling inside when I see others getting into shoot science. If you want to learn more about these recovery systems, considered the biggest engineering challenge when it comes to rockets, check out my documentary on the subject. Link in the description. Anyway, back to our timeline here. Next came Heat Shield Jettison. And since the gravity of Mars is 38% of Earth's, we get to savor the moment as it falls away in a very much elegant fashion. Oh, baby, you're killing me. <laughs> Shortly followed by the most expensive yo-yo trick you've ever seen lowering Percy down on cables before slicing them with pyrotechnic cutters, freeing up the jetpack to go crash land elsewhere. And so my name was officially placed on another world, in digital form. Something not everyone can say, just 11 million other people. You may be one of them, but this isn't about you. This is my show, okay? NASA also released a 360 image you can play around with on their YouTube channel. But if you go check it out, just temper your excitement, do it too fast and you'll throw up. The agency also released sounds of the Martian breeze recorded on the rover's microphone. I just want to make sure you could hear it. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you members and patrons for supporting the show. See you Sunday for the launch. Until that time, Godspeed. Godspeed.